Step one is actually jumping. You aren't going to improve your ability to overcome gravity if you have no prior experience doing so. As I'll explain, the forces of jumping are nothing like that compared to the weight room. You need to practice this. Gravity exerts an acceleration downward onto our bodies at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. That's 32 feet per second squared for us non-metric folk. That's like a 10 yard push downward, exponentially increasing every second that we're opposing it. So the longer you're in the air, the harder it is to overcome. And the more your mass, the more force it takes to oppose this. So how much force would it take to just stand upright and resist this force of gravity pulling us down? Simply put, the force I need to oppose to avoid my own mass from flattening towards the ground is the acceleration due to gravity times my mass. The units in mass is kilograms. So for me, I'd be about 85 kilograms. Just divide pounds by 2.2 to get there. Multiply the kilograms by the acceleration due to gravity and we get 833 newtons. Divide by a conversion factor of 4.44822 to convert newtons into pounds force and you get 187 pounds force. A very simple example, but this will be important for the rest of the video. So to stop my body from collapsing under the acceleration due to gravity, I need exactly 187 pounds of force. Any more and I'll be soaring above the ground, any less and I'll collapse to the floor. Now what if I wanted to accelerate my body to say a 40 inch vertical leap? We have two unknown variables in this instance. How much acceleration will it take to bring my 85 kilogram mass to a 40 inch vertical? And then how much force will it take to bring that 85 kilogram mass to a 40 inch vertical? If we're going to find force, we need to first find acceleration. If we're going to find this acceleration, we need to know what max speed we need to get to to project my body upwards to that 40 inch vertical. And we can do that using this formula here. We want a 40 inch vertical. Converting that into meters, that's 1.016 meters. We know the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. So just multiply by two. Finally, start to solve for max speed. Multiply by 19.6 on both sides and you're left with 19.9 .9 meters squared per second squared equals max speed in meters per second squared. Square root both sides and you're left with 4.5 meters per second as your max speed to reach a 40 inch vertical displacement. For our non-metric folk, stay with me, that's around 10 miles per hour. So for any given mass against Earth's gravity, it will need a max velocity of 10 miles an hour at takeoff to overcome Earth's deceleration due to gravity to reach a 40 inch displacement. What's different from this marker and myself is the amount of force to reach that speed. But now that we know max speed, we can find that acceleration that we would need for any object on Earth using this equation. V, our max speed, equals U, the initial speed, plus plus the acceleration to get to that speed multiplied by the time it took to get there. A pertinent ground contact time for a single leg vertical jump would be around 0.2 seconds. We already know the max speed we want is 4.5 meters per second, and we know that we're starting at zero meters per second. So we can cross that out and divide by 0.2. And we're left with 22.5 meters per second squared for our acceleration. So to recap at this point, the max speed any object on earth will need at the very least to reach a 40 inch displacement is around 10 miles per hour. And converting the prior value into something that at least I can understand a little bit better, we need to be able to accelerate by 70 feet per second for every second we are propelling that given mass upwards if we're going to reach this 10 miles per hour max velocity. Now, the reason humans have the capacity to go upwards so darn fast is by translating immense horizontal momentum into vertical momentum. Now, obviously, no one has the capacity just to continually accelerate 70 feet per second squared upwards without slowing down. It's only for that 0.2 second ground contact time. If it wasn't, we'd all be floating in space. Eventually, gravity always wins. Regardless of how it happens, whether I'm throwing the object up or I'm propelling my body up, an object needs to be accelerating upwards at around 70 feet per second squared if it's going to propel itself to a 10 mile an hour velocity and reach a 40 inch displacement. If this object is say 187 pound human, how much force do they need through that final plant if they're going to reach this 40 inch vertical displacement? Because we finally found our acceleration, we can now solve for force. The force in this instance is the final plant before takeoff. That's my mass in kilograms. That's the acceleration we just found. Multiply the two and you get 1,912.5 newtons, a unit we can divide by 4.448 to convert to pound force. In this instance, I would need 430 pounds of force in opposition to the force on me due to gravity if I'll be able to accelerate myself to 10 miles an hour and reach a 40 inch displacement. Feel free to plug in your own body weight values to solve for yourself. Now that's a lot of force in a very short amount of time. If I extrapolate that force to say one second, it would be the equivalent of a 2,135 pound one rep max 
one second concentric back squat. Now to put that comparison in context, the forces generated in a max approach vertical jump are not merely from muscle contraction. These forces can also be generated from translation of horizontal forces into vertical forces, greater arm swing and overall coordination in your jump, and greater muscular contraction on the tendon even as you propel through takeoff, all of which will yield greater contraction on the tendon from the muscle to slingshot you into the jump with that 430 pound force needed in that two tenth of a second window. So the ultimate goal for the aspiring 40 inch vertical jump leaper, like myself, would be to increase force capacity and speed of which you can produce that force. For improving force capacity, we have two categories. First is absolute, improving the output from the brain to the muscle with full range of motion squatting or hinging with chains. Here we aren't focusing on any particular point of the jump, just improving overall horsepower to the front and to the back of the legs. Greater pre-stretch equals more activation and accommodating resistance makes the naturally easier portions of the lift that much harder. We can also then specifically improve different portions of the jump. For horizontal, hitting the glutes from multiple force curves, whether it's with a back extension, straight legs, glute squeezed 45 degrees, progressively working greater strength one leg at a time, or a reverse hip thrust. Heel elevated, bend the knee, hips behind heels, tap the toes of the off leg's foot, come up, shoulders through the ceiling, straight leg at the end of the rep. Obviously balance between sides. Then you can also work the hamstrings with a Nordic curl device, or just strap your foot into a monkey foot hamstring curl device. All of these movements being crucial to get the juice to propel your body outwards, which your body will then utilize to transfer your body upwards. For specifically targeting vertical force production, what I love because of its specificity to the takeoff of your vertical jump is the Paul Oakland step. Hips in front of heels, knee over toe, off leg pointed up, kiss the heel and press up, making sure to use heel elevation to increase the knee dominance. It's not hard to see why this movement would be beneficial for improving the vertical jump in basketball players. Developing the VMO muscle, vastus medialis oblique muscle, the one that's closest to the kneecap and the most fast twitch of the quad muscles. You can't twitch fast if you have no muscle there to begin with. This one is great for developing those structures, as well as biasing the ACL, the connective tissue that holds the femur bone and the shin bone together as gravity tries to pull you apart, leading to bigger and stronger ligament over time. For calf dominant movements, I love elevating the toes to increase the stretch on the gastroxoleus complex. Lean into the stretch, full contraction at the top, maintain a straight leg and control coming down. Again, very specific to that ascending portion of your vertical jump, biasing more of the soleus muscle as you drop the shin and keep the shin down as you plantar flex and rise through your shoulders. Control, fight the fall coming down, full stretch at the bottom and explode coming up. Very simply for increasing the speed of that force production, just practice jumping. Your body will develop the coordination of all the muscles that you developed specifically to the task that you demanded to do. The more you jump, the faster it will produce force relative to the demands of that task. But also think about supplementing sprinting because sprinting has generally around the same ground contact time as a single leg max approach vertical jump, if not quicker, allowing you to get more exposure to a stimulus that tells your body produce force quicker. If you have any questions about how to apply any of these things, feel free to shoot a comment below or DM me on Instagram. I gladly help assist. Here's your greater pursuit of truth.